brace yourself and get ready to meet the big grey elephant in the room. It is the car that Ferrari said up until fairly recently it would never build its SUV. This is the Puro Sangue, a name that translates from Italian literally as thoroughbred. A bit insecure perhaps, a bit Ferrari protesting too much that this is a true Ferrari worthy of the name? Well, we'll think about the soul searching in a moment. For now, I'm going to exit stage left and you can drink in the looks. Thoughts? Well, on first impression, I'm surprised how much I like the Pura Sangue. There's a few reasons for that, let me tell you. Um, firstly, all these ducts and vents that we're, you can see, and even this massive bridge that you can sort of put your hand in, it's hot in there, um, they're all real, they're all functional. This is not a car that they've just cheaply slapped fake mesh on instead of styling it properly, which is good. And then also, apart from this big styling line there, it's not very fussy, is it? Back here, this rear haunch, it's very smooth. You could almost call it graceful, which is um, ironic, really, when you see what's under this enormous bonnet. Oh, I do love a front hinge bonnet. Look at the size of that. And then under here, a V12. This is not the first 12-cylinder SUV. Of course, there was the Bentley Bentayga W12 and the Rolls Cullinan but there's nothing like this. I mean, for a start, the entire six and a half liter engine is behind the front axle. I'm actually stood where the front axle is. That's here, whole engine's back there. And then like the old Ferrari FF and the GTC4 that came after it, there's a transfer box on the front of the engine to send drive to the front wheels and everything else goes down to a eight speed twin clutch gearbox at the back. When I say everything else, I mean 724 horsepower meaning you can get from 0 to 60, 3.3 seconds, 0 to 124, 10 and a half seconds, and the top speed, 194 miles an hour. This is undisputably the SUV speed king. If Ferrari will let me call it an SUV, which they don't want to, and well, if you think that's anything to be proud of. Maybe in future there'll be some sort of V6 hybrid, electric, who knows what else they can squeeze under this, well, enormous nose but for now as a unique selling point the ultimate ferrari statement love letter to v12s that is what you're buying the purit sangue for okay some other things to note because the gearbox is right at the back it's got perfect weight balance 51 percent over the rear wheels uh, ferrari makes absolutely no claims at all any mention in the press pack about off-roading okay i don't think you're taking this anywhere dirty you might scratch your 23 inch wheels. Um, what it's all about is on-road handling. It's got the clever ABS system from the 296. It's got the latest generation of side slip angle control. The car is constantly learning how much grip there is at each tire. It's got independent rear wheel steering, which is something we first saw on the 812 Competizione. So the rear wheels are kind of doing their own thing no matter what you're doing with the steering wheel. That's phenomenally clever. Then there's the aero. So this you might recognize from the old F12 Berlinetta, air being ejected from the engine, drafted out of the bonnet, shot down the side of the car. It's all very trick. And as you'll see, there's ducting around the wheel arches. It's really porous, really open, but there is no downforce claim for this car. Ferrari hasn't quoted one, says it wasn't a design sort of consideration, wasn't a parameter when they were styling this. It's all about an efficient aero shape and they don't really need it to generate downforce because it has got some super trick suspension and handling technology to make it stick to the corners. Now, with all this technology on board and a big old V12, you weren't expecting the Pura Sangue to be a light car. And um, well, you're not wrong. Despite the fact that it's on an all new platform and it's mostly aluminium, there is some carbon fiber, like the uh, standard carbon fiber roof. This car has the optional glass. Yeah, despite all that, this is quoted a meaningless dry weight of 2,173 kilos with all the lightweight options. So if you add all the fluids that you need to actually make it move, like coolant and oil and add some fuel to the 100 litre tank, it's gonna be, gonna be more than that. You add the family on board, this is easily a 2.3 tonne Ferrari. But 
because of all the suspension and brake and clever you know handling tech and even the sort of you know help you drift modes that ferrari has embedded into the pura sangue they are adamant that it does behave properly in fact they don't even call it a gt car they say that this is simply a four-door four-seat super agile sports car now this is all terribly complicated but basically what you've got is adaptive suspension with no anti-roll bars instead there's an electric motor on the top of each shock absorber and that spins to counteract body roll and pitch so ferrari insists that its tallest car ever can still corner flat and level and when you're not absolutely door handling it that electric motor can actually help hitch the wheel up as you hit a bump like you'd lift the handlebars on a mountain bike as you're running over a rut or a tree root and just ease the jolt just smooth out the bump and you get a comfier ride now ferrari calls this ferrari active suspension technology fast or fast for short it's a good job they didn't call it ferrari's unbelievably clever kinematics really here we go then, a whistle-stop tour around the Pura Sangue's insides because it's a, well, it's a different interior from what you're used to with Ferrari. So let's start off with what's actually familiar, and that's, well, this, what's in front of me. This is all very SF90 and 296, you've got this huge digital display, big rev counter straight in the middle, and then the menus either side are all worked by haptic feedback touch sensitive buttons, which live on the steering wheel, which being a Ferrari already contains your indicators, your wiper controls, and the headlights, and obviously has the gear shift paddles behind. Now I've driven a 296 and an SF90, and I hated all of this, I found it really tricky, really difficult to use, and even someone who works a Ferrari told me what he recommends customers do is actually set up your sat-nav radio station, everything that you do with a car's infotainment system, before you set off, because it's actually impossible to do it when you're driving along. So they have tried to improve all that for the Pura Sangue. There's now these little kind of detents, little indentations in the steering wheel buttons, it's sort of bonging at me now, um, to help you help your thumbs find what you're looking for. Um, we'll find out when we drive it if it's worked, but I still don't like it. Uh, what else? Down here, the Manatino, obviously how you change your Ferrari's mood. That has changed. So there's now an ice mode. That's the only kind of clue I can find that you're sat in an SUV. I'm sat low, I don't have a command driving position unless I jack the seat right up. I've got this very, very high shoulder line. I feel very cocooned, very much like I'm in a proper sports car. And there's no, yeah, no low range, no towing setting. All I've got is ice. And then up from there, wet mode, then comfort, and then sport. You can go fully ESC off if you're completely crackers, but yeah, no race mode, interesting. And if I click my damper button, normally that just turns bumpy road mode on and off in any other Ferrari, but no, in here I've got three settings, soft suspension, medium, and hard. So yeah, there's more for the customer to kind of play with and set the car up how they like, but ultimately perhaps not as hardcore. Over here is more touch sensitive stuff, oh dear. Um, think that adjusts the ride height, but the bit you want to play with over here, Oh, worth the money alone for this. Look at that. Pop out climate control controls and then simply twist to adjust the fan speed and temperature. Absolutely love it. Okay, practical Ferrari. Let's get back onto practicalities. Wireless charging pad down here, rubberized, your phone won't slide around. Cup holders there. Uh, this is obviously your gearbox sort of settings, reverse, automatic, manual, and the launch control. Here are the window switches. Don't go looking for them on the steering wheel. In there, storage and some USB ports. What else? Oh, I should mention the one thing I can't really show you. This is the most expensive smelling car ever. I absolutely love it. I feel richer just from sitting in here. I think it makes my clothes smell nicer. It's just the leathers, the quality of the stitch in the carbon fiber is fantastic. The carbon has little strengths of copper in it for no reason other than it looks nice, but it certainly feels like a really, really expensive car in here. Well worthy of competing with, yeah, Bentaygas and Cullinans and frankly making an Urus feel like an absolute Audi inside. Right, one more thing. All Ferrari interiors are normally very, very selfish places, just for the driver, so they should be. But Ferrari's had a rethink for the Pura Sangue. So over here in front of the passenger, 
you get like a whole second dashboard. See, vents, but instead of a steering wheel, what they get is this massive 10 and a half inch touchscreen with sat nav, air con, seat control, settings. They can, yes, still see what the driver's doing. You can get speed and tire temperature readout and all the kind of Ferrari gimmicks, but they can also just control the infotainment. I think that works really well. I think it's a good idea for what should be ultimately a family car. But um, yeah, seeing how it works as a family car, we need to really jump in the back. Okay, now we wouldn't normally spend much time on the back seats of a Ferrari, but this is the practical one. So, practicality rules. Oh, almost forgot. Let me just uh, automatically close my door. Oh, how cool is that? Now, we left this in my driving position from earlier. I'm exactly six feet tall. I like to sit quite upright, but far away from the wheel. I've got it extended as far out as it comes from the dashboard. And yet, yeah, look at this. I can sit behind me with loads of knee room. I've got plenty of room for my size 12s and shoulders don't feel hemmed in. My head's not against the ceiling. I'd be very, very happy back here. Only problem is this pillar here. And yeah, there is quite narrow, heavily tinted glass. Just make it feel a bit dark. So how can I distract myself? What have I got to play with? Hmm, not a lot. I think there's a mounting point here for some sort of screen. Got some window switches. I've got um, USB sockets. And yes, I've got my pop-up dial here for adjusting heated seat and air conditioning. If you are thinking, ah, I won't option this, you know, leather sideboard here. Um, I'd like mine as a five-seater, a bit more practical. Forget it, because Ferrari are very strictly only selling the Pura Sangue as one, two, three, four seater. You'll always have this here to differentiate it from the other SUV. So that means you get cup holders and it means you get this lovely pop-up dial. Just can't stop playing with that. It's fantastic. But um, yeah, I don't think ultimately it's like a Range Rover or a Bentayga where you could argue the best place to be is actually sat in the back. I prefer to um, have the V12 to play with. Okay, keep up. We're working our way from the front to the back. Here we are at the back. Here are some things that I've spotted. Um, there's no rear wiper on your SUV. Is that a problem? Well, Ferrari spent many years in the wind tunnel. They know a thing or two about aerodynamics. And look, there are strakes in the glass itself. Must be very expensive. Must help with the aero. Might keep your rear screen clean. And under this wing, I don't know if you can see under here, but there's actually little strakes under there as well. All adjusting the air, very Formula One. Now, come down here. Big old carbon fibery diffuser. And you can actually see the back of the transaxle gearbox, which is a proper supercar touch and I really love. But I can't see anywhere to mount a tow bar. So if you want to use your prancing horse to tow your prancing horse, forget it. Now, let's have a look in the boot. There we are then. There is the practical end of your Ferrari, not an SUV. It doesn't look um, massive, does it? I think that's the sloping roof line for you. But there are some practical touches that we should note. I mean, under here, despite the gearbox being at the back, you've got a hidden storage locker. There's buttons for flipping the back seat's down automatically, so you can I don't know, take it to Ikea. And if we remove this very expensive parcel shelf, then you can flip that bulkhead away and lob some skis in the back. Okay, it's not ultimately as practical as like an Audi RS6, but pretty good for a Ferrari. Um, one thing they haven't got around to telling me yet is how many litres this boot actually is. So if they have announced that by the time the video comes out, it will appear on your screen now. Oh. And uh, speaking of numbers that have not been finalised, the Pura Sangue's price is today, as we're recording this, still a secret. So what do we think? Well, Ferrari will give me two clues. They say that V12 Ferraris always command a premium, and Ferraris that launch with lots of new technology are more expensive. And this has both of those things. So where a Range Rover starts at £100,000 and a Bentley Bentayga is like at 150000 this is going to be more, I reckon, quarter of a million pounds easy. But have your butler stack that neatly. The notes, maybe in designer briefcases, it'll fit in here, no problem. Okay, if you've stuck with me this long, then thank you. You probably have a more open mind than most about a Ferrari SUV. So I want to leave you with this point, okay? Ferrari doesn't, doesn't need to build this car. 
What I mean by that is this is not a car to save Ferrari. It's not like the Aston Martin DBX where Aston has absolutely bet the farm on that car saving the company. And Porsche maybe wouldn't even be here today if it hadn't come up with the Cayenne. See, those car makers end up becoming, well, SUV makers with a sideline in sports cars. Over 50% of Aston Martin sales, now the DBX. Over 50% of Lamborghini sales, now the Urus. And, well, yeah, Porsche is an SUV maker with a small niche sideline in sports cars. Well, Ferrari's nothing like that, you see. Ferrari is the outlier in the sports car world because it is phenomenally profitable just making sports cars. I mean, it has this bulging order book that's the envy of the world, full of cars that are optioned up to the sun visors, and then there's billionaires queuing round the block, fighting each other to get on the list for a limited edition special. So while this isn't a car I would necessarily lust after, like a 296 or a 458 Speciale, I can appreciate this is a really, really useful cash stream for Ferrari, just at the point it's entering one of its most critical decades ever, moving to hybrids, pivoting eventually into electric cars. And um, well, yeah, if I was the CEO of a rival car company who was depending on an SUV right now to keep the factory lights on, if I saw this thing coming from my customers right about now, I would be feeling clenched. <laughs>